I really can't reiterate how important it is to cultivate that space in your life to learn how to be present, to learn how to see those habits and patterns, right? And that, that kind of fork in the road where those old reactions are waiting and over time to make the space for these new choices because it is through choice that we actually get to create our future. Otherwise, and this is what most of us are doing when we're in that stuck space, are just repeating our past and getting increasingly more frustrated, more unfulfilled and more resentful and are doing all of the things to try to manage and cope. I'm Dr. Nicole LaPera. I'm a holistic psychologist, and this is Behind the Brand with Brian Elliott. Hey everyone, I'm Brian Elliott. Welcome to another edition of Behind the Brand. Doctor, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Brian. Nicole, thank you for letting us be fast friends and letting me call you, Nicole. I appreciate it. And um, I usually ask my, my guests, how did you get this job? I love that question. So I think my answer for that is my life's journey, really. As long as I can remember, very intuitively, I was drawn to the mind, the brain, understanding people. So becoming a clinical psychologist and then evolving into working holistically as I do now, for me, just felt like part of my journey. So one might say I was born into it. That's awesome. I always like to ask, I like to go back in the chronology and ask, like, what was young Nicole thinking about when she was a little girl, thinking about what, what she wanted to be when she grew up? Um, and I ask that with context because... A lot of people are doing some soul searching now, whether you're middle age, mid career, trying to hit the reset button, trying to figure out what to do, or you're a young person, you know, um, I want to find out like, what were your influences? Cause I'm also very interested in, in nature versus nurture and we, and we can unpack that a little bit later, but what did you want to be when you grew up? As long as I can remember, like I said, I was fascinated with people. Um, looking back, I now understand it that I think like a lot of us, um, from a very young age, I saw evidence of being different. Um, I think a lot of us feel different at our core. And for yeah. me, you know, I, I think from that place of under curiosity, I think it began, why am I different? Um, yeah. drew, kind of grew this, like I said, this intuitive desire to understand. How, how are you different? How was I different? I yeah. um, saw many ways that I felt different very early on. Um, in my family, I was born to parents who were a bit older in life. I had a 15 year old sister at the time I was born and a 18 year old brother. So very early on, I felt separate from my siblings. I felt like I was having a different family experience than most of my peers. You know, when we go to <laughs> school, we begin to have those points of comparison um, where we get to see what other people's life looks like. And very early on, like I said, I was very aware that my parents were older. Um, with me, that came a lot of anxiety around that, a lot of fears about them being older. And like I said, I... I think for me, it was seeing that different family structure that was really evident um, very early on. Yeah, and um, I, I love psychology too. I love um, analyzing and thinking about my own behavior because it's very helpful for me to be, you know, take inventory and, and also, you know, get feedback from other people, right? Because um, I, I, I'm someone who likes to be in this constant state of trying to improve. Uh, I feel like a work in progress in many, many ways, but go, go deeper into that. So what were you afraid of? Like your parents were older. Were you afraid that they were going to not be with you very much longer? Was it like an attachment issue or abandonment issue? Yeah, there was a lot of, um, health related anxiety. Um, mm -hmm. for me in particular, it was very real in the home. My sister who was 15 years older than me, um, was pretty chronically ill from a young age. She had a really okay. severe asthma attack. Um, which yeah. led her needing to be have a tracheotomy. Um, mm. and she was living at home in my parents' care, and so they were around the clock needing to care for you know a little child okay. with very real health concerns. And the reason why I share this is because my mother um, actually suffered a pretty sudden loss um, when her own father died of a heart attack pretty abruptly when she was in her early 20s. So both of these things are interacting. My mom, I think, carried her own, or I know, carried her own anxiety, fear of health. Um, whenever yeah. ever, ever anyone dies or you know falls ill very suddenly, that jolts us 
we become mm-hmm. reminded, right, that life is transient and that people can leave. So from that space, I think my mom had her own anxiety that she, you know, carried with her, as we do. We all bring the past with us, or so I think. And then when she um, gave birth to my sister, and my sister obviously progressed into having her own chronic illnesses, I think for my mom, it really brought the anxiety level uh, pretty, pretty high. And I believe that all of those messages were communicated in the home, even though we weren't saying, and my mom wasn't saying, oh, I'm nervous all the time. The feeling yeah. in the home was of that anxiety. So I was born as we all are a very attuned being or so I believe. Mm-hmm. So I picked up on that. So for me, it was, it felt like a very real concern that my mom could die because I was introduced to that concept in a very indirect way, death that is. And at, at a time when yeah. you're young, it's really overwhelming for a child. Yeah. Uh, maybe my reaction is, uh-oh, <laughs> I hope I'm not doing that same thing to my kids. Like, were you, uh, were you sort of like wrapped in metaphorical bubble wrap? Like, were they, were they extra careful around you? Or was it just like sort of the, the narrative, the storyline? Yeah, no, not at all. They were, it was just the narrative, the storyline, and how it actually translated behaviorally is a lot yeah. of distraction. Uh, my mom and my dad's attention was on the next fire or the next imagined fire that they would either realistically, because it was happening, yeah. or you know, just fearful that something else could happen. So for yeah. me, it felt like I, I had a lot of time, here's that word, alone, um, not really with support. Um, and again, this doesn't mean in actual behavior, because I did have parents that I was very athletic. They showed up at games. They were there on the sidelines. We had dinner every <laughs> night together, sitting physically around the same table. Um, so this loneliness that I'm describing is, is more emotional, and it didn't yeah. come from over-focus of attention. For me, it came from almost an inability to pay that really focused attention. Yeah. Wow, thank you for sharing that. Uh, so you're an athlete. What was your sport? Um, I played many sports when I was younger, and I discovered by high school age that I was quite good at softball. Um, so I mm. continued to play softball throughout college, actually. Yeah. What was your position? I was a pitcher. Okay. So I like to, like, I'll use many signals, like, to do my um, pseudo psychoanalysis of someone's character, or beha- you know, or of their personality. Uh, sometimes it's based on the kind of shoes they wear or the car they drive, or sometimes it's the sport that they play. But I actually think that speaks a lot about you, that you're a pitcher, softball, and you played it through college. I mean, to me, I can read into that pretty deeply, I think, fairly accurately and maybe figure out what kind of person you are. You're a baller, (laughs) I'm guessing. I mean, for me, you know, and and you would be not incorrect in reading into it because I do think that my performance, um, performing up through college, you know, at a division Mm -hmm. one level, layer um, level, being in an Ivy League school, I was very academically driven. For me, Mm -hmm. that was my distraction. That allowed me to focus my attention so I didn't have to feel all of the underlying stuff, feelings that for me had been bubbling up, accumulating over time. It was also how I got attention. Like I said, my parents were at those softball fields. They celebrated my A's. I got money for good grades. So it Mm -hmm. does make sense that that became my channel. And I think it does for a lot of us. And it's confusing from the outside, and this actually led me into what I now refer to as my, my own dark night of the soul, really just questioning myself from top to bottom, including my profession, um, leading me you know, through my own healing journey. Um, and I, what I realized is that you know, a lot of people, I do think, are engaging in these distractions. And from the outside, life looks great. If you would have looked at my life, you would have wondered why I was struggling, quote unquote, in the way that I felt. Right, she's got everything going for her. She's a top athlete, she's doing well in school, you know, she's attractive, she's probably outgoing, you know, all these things. Yeah, it feels like you check all the boxes. And then there's, I think for many of us, that voice inside where we do shame ourselves. We do look around and wonder what the heck is wrong with me. And for me, by that point in my life, I had the private practice. I had been working in all different contexts of inpatient, outpatient, people with substance abuse patterns and issues, etc. So meaning I saw people who quote unquote, or so I believed had it worse based on their past experiences or current living experiences. Yet I still saw the same habits and patterns in myself as I saw in them. So for me, 
Um, a lot of us can carry shame. I did entertain a narrative of brokenness. I wondered what genetically must be wrong with me, my brain, right? Maybe I just, I'm not happy. Maybe I'm just a sad, you know, depressed, feelingless person. I don't know. Um, and mm -hmm. what I came to realize, Brian, is that none of that is the case. Um, again, that the reason that I was feeling the way I was was from an accumulation of these life experiences, though I share all of this to also acknowledge why I speak about um, things like, especially me, someone who looks outwardly to be doing just fine, um, how shameful that can be for many of us when we don't feel like we're doing fine internally. So I have, I have so many questions. It's so interesting. I really appreciate you sharing that personal stuff. Um, I want to talk about nature versus nurture and your opinion on that. Uh, and I'll give you more context to why I think that's relevant to this conversation. And I'm happy to share with you my own uh, personal story, which I would love your feedback on. I know we can't do maybe a, a session together here, but maybe we could do a quasi session where you can analyze me and, and maybe give me some tips and pointers. But before that, I want to ask about maybe your you know this magnetism or this um, being drawn to understanding human behavior um, do you think that's common with people who struggle with these types of issues I know I've, I've been there I, I considered well I would love to study more about psychology I did a little bit in college um, and I and I toyed with the idea of, of majoring in psychology just because I thought it was so fascinating I ended up going the marketing route um, which, you know, is actually very helpful to understand human behavior, psychology, and all that. But uh, how is that working for you as someone who, you know, has struggled with these issues that you talk about? And then going into a profession where you sort of have to be the leader, the boss, the person in charge, the healthy one. How do, does, is that common? How does that work? Yeah, I think a lot of people, um, you know, that seek to understand, that are driven into the field, um, what yeah. I know, let me just back up a minute, what I know about humans is that we don't like to not know. We don't like uncertainty. We don't like, you know, that right. blank line or that dot, dot, dot. So in absence of that knowing, we're driven to attempt at least to understand. So that's how I understand yeah. Um, my own that kind of intuitive ping setting me out on that journey to understand it's because I didn't get it I didn't know why right my friend yeah. wasn't doing the same things I would be offering my friend or responding in the same way to a similar event right I didn't understand so there was that uncertainty and I think like most of us we don't like that uncertainty so to gain control to feel safe we see. Yeah. So if I can understand by, you know, an algorithm or I can pinpoint that this is why and I can predict then what the person will do next, I feel safer. And I'm using these words really intentionally, Brian, because we all are really evolutionarily wired to keep ourselves safe. And according to our, evo our, our biology, safety is inherent in that which is familiar. Even if it's not logically giving us the life we want, it's the path we understand. Yeah. And that word control, whether it's a trigger for me or not, it really rings true. It's very relatable because I think that's probably at the heart of several of the issues that I struggle with, like feeling like a lack of control or, uh, you know, wanting to have more control over the outcome, whatnot. So I'd love to explore that more. Um, let's go back to nature versus nurture. You know, this show is watched by entrepreneurs, people who have small businesses, who, or, or maybe they have, maybe they're working for the man and they have a, a side hustle that they dream about being their main thing one day. And some people say, you know, oh, I, I'm not cut out for this, or I was born to do this. What's your take on are entrepreneurs born or made? Or psychologists, are they born or made? We can talk about that too. Before I dive into the answer, I just want to share with everyone that I was one of those people that really did not feel that I had the quote unquote, this is the language my mind would use, the business mind. Um, mm -hmm. I worked for a family that was very much consistent. And one of the messages of consistency was around security of income. Um, a father who very much was a, a proponent of me actually working for someone else, of when I shared with my family I was going into private practice, which is a version of business ownership, they were like, oh, 
mm, are you sure what happens when right payment doesn't come in? Are you going to be able to pay your bills? And I see. I share my experience of that because for a very long time, I did entertain that belief. I did not think I was business minded. I did not think I knew how to run a business. And yet here I am a decade or so later running a business and feeling very much entrepreneurial, um, creative minded. So to answer that question, um, nature versus nurture for a very long time in my field, we were taught um, a model of genetics that's called genetic determinism, which is simply, as I often do, simplify things. It's just the idea that our genes, the nature we're born at birth, is the sole determinant of what happens in life. So if you're born with the genetic chip to get that medical or psychological, here's anxiety for me, right? You are going to inevitably have that condition later in life or at some point in life Right. Making the conversation of the work I was doing with my past clients, one merely of management. How can we give you the medication or provide you with the tools to tolerate life within this spectrum of having the disease or right. disorder? Yeah. We now know that's not true. Um, several years, decade ago or so, we started to realize and, and really believe in a new science of epigenetics, which says yes. We all are born with genes and chromosomes and all of that biology. However, we're not as powerless as we once thought we were. The choices that we're making day in and day out, how we're caring for our body, the sleep we're getting, the stress that we either can or cannot manage, that is actually going to be, as they say, right, what fires the gun, what results mm -hmm. in whether or not we get that medical or psychological condition or not. I believe, actually, Brian, that our life experiences, those choices that we're making day in and day out, not only determine whether or not we're gonna get a condition or not, I actually believe that they determine our personality, our just general practiced way of being. So to answer your question, it's both, um, though a lot of us are living stuck in these habits and patterns that we've been repeating since childhood, falsely yeah. believing that we have no other option, and this was me included. So like I said, I had this conversation with myself around everything from my body. I saw similar patterns in digestion and sleep issues in my whole family. So for a very long time, I thought I was gifted with that unfortunate genetics and here I am having it. Same thing with right. anxiety. I saw it like I shared earlier in my mom, in my family, whether or not she wanted to admit it or not, there, there's who gifted me that genetic component. If we mm -hmm. really want to dive into it, a lot of my personality for a long time was operating very similar to those that I was modeled, the relationships that I experienced growing up. Um, so yeah. for a very long time, I thought I was you know, genetically always going to have anxiety. And again, yeah. all of those personality traits, I adopted very similar to my mom, my dad. And I did believe that in that, you know, kind of excluded me from being a business person, from understanding business. So for me in my healing, and this is why I proclaim this from the rooftops, because I, if I can be the person who opens that door, who just provides a little bit of information, if you did think you were inevitably destined to whether, it, again, it's medical, psychological, or maybe inevitably destined to not be able to have your own business, if I can be someone that can offer, right, can slip that door open a bit, um, because I, I do believe that incredible change is possible and that nothing is really as set in stone as we once believed. I love that. And um, it reminds me of that Stevie Nicks song, I've been afraid of changing since I built my life around you. You know, that yeah. that whole idea that it's hard to change because we or we tell ourselves those same stories. And And I love what you said. You know, if I could sort of restate, it's something I also learned uh, interestingly enough, from Caesar Milan, the dog whisperer, who's like this renowned dog guy. And he said, it turns out, Brian, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it sounds like you're saying the same thing for humans. Like we're not destined to live this story that we've been told or we've told ourselves, whether we think it's genetic or biologic or whatever. There's we have the power to change certain things. And I think that's a really powerful message. Yeah, it's um, incredibly powerful. And, and our, our bodies and our brains actually show that. Again, we now know of something called neuroplasticity. There was a very long time we entertained this idea that our brains were done developing in our 20s. 
Now we know that's, that's grossly untrue. We can fire and wire, as we like to say, nor- yeah. new neural networks all through life. And I was actually, I put up a post today and I had a bunch of uh, people in my virtual membership, the Self Healer Circle, responding in their 60s, in their 70s, expressing gratitude for these small changes that they're now beginning to make in their life. And this is decades that I think a lot of people do feel like, oh, well, by then, you know, can't teach an old dog new tricks type of thing. Um, And here we have a lot of humans now from around the world really challenging that through their own life. Yeah. It's nice to have representation so that we can see that it's possible. I want to go back to something you said about your dad. Um, I think the advice was really great and very subtle. Maybe the audience might have missed it. But I think we have to be really careful... You know, in journalism, um, and I have sort of a foot in both country, right? I'm doing editorial, and I'm also doing commercial production and, and documentary storytelling. But in, in journalism in particular, they always talk about considered the source. And sometimes the sources of our information are good and accurate, uh, full of facts and whatnot. And then sometimes they're biased. Well, I would say maybe all the time they're biased. But, like, think about your dad. Um, you know, he gave you this advice, which was probably with good intentions, very sage advice, like, be careful, don't go work for yourself because it's not as safe and secure as going to work for someone else. So you can just get a regular paycheck. And, you know, sure, 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago, that was the model, right? You go to school, you get your piece of paper, you go work for a company for 30 years, you get your pension, your gold watch, and then you're good, right? Um, And so maybe that was what work for him but I think we have to be really careful about um, the advice that we get we need to run it through the filter of okay who's this coming from Um, and like what is their context and what is their experience because sometimes it can go both ways right we get good people who have wisdom people who have lived longer than us or uh, or can see something that we don't but also they're heavily biased from a certain um, era or lifestyle or upbringing whatnot right yeah, I'm, I'm smiling um, because I, I, I believe, and I, I would go as far to say, and I love that suggestion of consider the source, I would go as far to say that we are all subjective to some degree. So anything yeah. we're hearing from someone outside of ourself is colored inevitably in their experience, their life, the meaning yeah. they've assigned. So we can use that. That's not to say throw out every, every suggestion or any observation that anyone has ever shared with me and don't take any feedback. I know best. Absolutely not. I've gotten some of the hardest feedback to swallow from those closest to me who are able to see me from a bit more objective. So those that have lived experiences and part of the goal that my intention of using social media was to begin to have an outlet to speak my journey, my truth with the hope that maybe one or two humans out there might resonate with some aspect of it. I had no expectation it was going to take off and be so universally resonant. However, I I say that, and I do that, and I do this daily, and I will continue to share my story and urge everyone else does. Because I believe when we're all showing up in our truth, when we're all speaking based on our lived experience, even though it will all be subjective to some extent, we can learn to hear it and to pick the pieces that we resonate with as a human and incorporate or integrate that into our own journey. I believe that the collective itself, other humans are the infinite source of wisdom to inform our own journeys. And then we live that into our experience for ourselves. And I don't think anything is a greater teacher than our own lived experience. Yeah. And I like that idea to me, it sounds a lot like there really is no particular destination. It's all, it's just a process of becoming, and, you know, uh, we're either, it's either plus minus, right? Like, so we're, we're either losing ground or we're gaining ground on who we want to become based on our choices, right? Yeah, I'm smiling really big because uh, I, I was the first person, I think I actually led quite a few expeditions to find the elusive state of doneness. I used to call <laughs> it my utopian hippie hammock where I could just throw my peace signs, let the air in my hair and just have nothing else to do yeah you're done i've made okay. it healed Whew. over yeah. Just, yeah yeah and and again if anyone's listening and has found that place um all ears though i'm settling into the the reality in a sense that that's not the case that we are all on the journey on the process that for many of us is the most difficult uh you know space to inhabit that 
knowing that there is no end. And like, I, that's why I shared my experience. Cause for me, that was hard. It was hard to acknowledge that this is ongoing and that life will continue to shift and change. And even if I think I know how to navigate life in my now 38 year old body, I don't know what 48 is going to be like. I don't know what 50 and 68 is going to be like. I might have to modify my tools and myself at those different stages. So I actually yeah. can go as far to make a case that done, we don't really want to achieve that state of doneness because we are ever changing, unfortunately, because I think that too provides a lot of challenge for a lot of us. Mm -hmm.